Hello. Thanks for joining today for Cherry Beckert's uh, webinar on the cost of county standards. This is actually part two in our webinar series on the cost of county standards. And today we will be walking through the, uh, you know, what is a cost of county change and the impact and items to consider for a uh, federal contractor who is cast covered. We will talk through some pitfalls, items to avoid, you know, what are that, what is that actual process? And to start off, let's get into intros. Presenting today is myself, Eric Poppy, a director in our government contracting industry practice. And with me today is Brendan Holleran, a senior manager in the government contracting industry practice as well. Uh, we both specialize in helping government contractors uh, honestly just work with making their, trying to help our clients have easier lives when working with the federal government, uh, specializing in business systems, cost accounting standards, indirect rates, uh, contract clauses, uh, and uh, helping to strategize when working with the federal government to help avoid fires and put out fires. Um, so, Brendan, thanks for joining me today. And, you know, I'm, I'm pumped to be you know, talking through part two of uh, the cost of county standards. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Glad to be here. Always a great topic. <clears throat> So today's agenda, we are going to give a quick recap on what the cost of county standards are. If you missed part one of our series, which was in September, we're going to walk through the regulations and the criteria out there about what is considered a cost accounting change, what that might impact for you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about modified versus full coverage and does a, would a cost accounting change impact you if you are modified versus uh, full. We're going to talk through the administrative uh, an administrative change versus a practice change, talk through a cost impact, what that is, and then what the difference between a GDM is versus a DCI, what that submission process looks looks like if you are submitting a cost accounting change, and you know what is the cadence that you need to submit that in, and then also talk through some pitfalls and some um, I, you know big picture items to consider when you're going through this process. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes into this topic and we could honestly dive deep into a full um, other webinar on just GDMs or what is a practice change, but we're gonna try to hit everything at a pretty high level and give a quick summary from what we did, what we covered in part one, uh, but talk through you know things to consider if you are cast covered and you're thinking about a cost to county change. So with that, we would like to do a quick recap about what are the cost accounting standards. Um, you know, in short, they are a cost accounting standards is required um, for federal contractors and subcontractors that they make you that force a company to disclose their cost accounting practices and follow and follow them consistently. There's two types of coverage: full coverage and modified coverage. Um, modified coverage is above 7.5 million in a contract award versus 50 million. There are cer certain exemptions uh, with the cost of county standards. So if it is a small business award, if it is uh, a fixed price award that's competitively awarded, um, there are some other exemptions as well. Cost of county standards define what a segment is and that, you know, if it's a separate PL, <clears throat> management line, product or service. Uh, the cost accounting standards also define uh, what a disclosure statement is and that you need to have a disclosure statement if you are, um, if you trigger CAS. Disclosure statement is a large, uh, pretty much a, a working manual about your cost accounting practices that outlines how you handle direct versus indirect cost, how you handle um, the treatment of a certain types of costs, define your indirect rate rates, go into some retirement. Uh, capitalization, depreciation, uh, and other major elements of cost that might impact your contract pricing. And the cost accounting centers also outlines what happens if there's a change, which is what we're really going to focus in on today. With that, how, it, how do you know if CAS or cost accounting centers is applicable to you? Well, there is a nice flow chart, which is here that we're going to go through over the next couple slides that we also went through in part one, that uh, it, just to give a quick refresher on what you when you should be looking out for CAS. So the big thing is you need, first need a triggering event, um, which would be a single award that is over 7.5 million. Uh, if you, then after you hit the 7.5 million, you are working towards a $50 million mark. 
of anything over the Tina threshold. Uh, but if you but you've trigger have that trigger event of 7.5 million, you would be considered cast covered. Now, in the box on the far right are those exemptions that we talked about a few moments ago. And you know, for the essence of time, not going to go through every single one of these, but again, contracts that are awarded to small businesses, sealed bid contracts, um, negotiated contracts or subcontracts not in excess of the thresholds found and uh, 10 USC, um, commercial items, if there's adequate price competition for fixed price. So again, there's a variety of different things here, but the big thing that we want to cover here is first you need that triggering event of 7.5 million to trigger modified cash coverage, and then you're working towards that 50 million. So if you trigger that 7.5 million contract award, you'd be considered modified cash covered. If you are considered modified cast covered, you then have four different standards that you have to abide by. Cast 401, 402, 405, and 406. A lot of those standards, or the, the items that are covered in those standards are a lot of what you are probably already doing as a uh, uh, as a federal contractor now if you have a, fix, or a flexibly priced contract. Unallowable costs, consistent cost accounting period, uh, Consistence in how you're accumulating versus estimating your cost. Uh, and a lot of those underlying principles of FAR Part 31. Now, if you have a single award over 50 million or a net cast covered awards over 50 million, you're considered full cast covered. And then you're subject to all 19 standards. Now, those 19 standards would include 401, 2, 5, and 6. However, you'd also then have to deal with standards that rely uh, that relate to capitalization, retirement, uh, treatment of IRD and BMP, treatment of GNA, corporate home office, uh, and, and some other items as well. Now, if you are cast covered, <clears throat> you're required to have a disclosure statement. And so with that, the disclosure statement again is pretty much a cost accounting manual that outlines your cost accounting practices. Now, if you are a home office <laughs> or you're a company that has multiple segments underneath it de defined by CAS 403, you might have multiple disclosure statements, one for the home office and then one for each segment. Now, if you have a cost accounting change after you've submitted your disclosure statement, outlined your cost accounting practices, and you have decided to make a change, add a new indirect rate pool, for example, you would then have to revise your disclosure statement and you potentially would have a cost impact. Yeah, one thing um, on that, Eric, too, is that we, we get the question quite a bit, you know, about, you know, cast coverage. And, you know, the one thing that we always remind clients is, you know, it's the contract is cast covered. And so, you know, if, um, you know, if, you know, a contractor, you know, was exempt, perhaps they were, you know, small business, and then, you know, grow into, um, you know, really more of a large business um, standard. Um, certainly, you know, contracts subsequent to kind of making that transition, um, you know, to a large business, you know, could be <clears throat> um, cast covered, but the, you know, contracts, you know, that they had, you know, prior to that, you know, don't then, you know, um, automatically um, become cast covered. So that's something as you're tracking contracts, um, and we certainly encourage, um, you know, clients to do that is to really, you know, have a good, um, you know, a good resource in terms of, you know, um, obviously contract details, you know, what was or, or um, you know, what is uh, cast covered, because, you know, that that will be for the duration or performance of that contract. And that's a good, that's a really good point. And uh, we also recommend that if a contractor believes that the contract will trigger CAS, that you should be preparing a disclosure statement if you are not CAS covered. And if you, sometimes that disclosure statement is required to be submitted as part of the RFP as well. Yeah. Um, and I know that, you know, there, you can see here in this table <clears throat> that, you know, if CAS cover rewards during the prior year are less than 10 million and less than 30% of segment sales, then you might not be required to have a disclosure statement. But really, if you have triggered modified cast coverage, 
you're working towards full cast coverage, you're a government contractor that does a, a lot of work in this in the, in the federal space versus commercial, having it prepped and ready to go is, is, is a, one of those best practices. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit uh, and we'll certainly drill down into a little bit more detail about the regulations and procedures that you need to follow um, when you are um, you know, implementing a cost accounting practice change. And so, you know, pretty much from, from here on in, we talked a little bit about, you know, what would be CAS covered and, and what are some of those requirements. And so this is really kind of um, delving into the area where, you know, a contractor is um, fully CAS covered. And so um, here we just, um, and these are just a few of the points for each of these regulations, but these are the key, um, you know, the key regs that folks need to be aware of. And, you know, the reason we wanted to point these out is that, you know, whether you're in finance or, um, you know, a compliance function, or a lot of times that's, you know, really kind of a dual headed role, um, it's really important to, you know, understand the, you know, the process, the timing, the requirements, um, you know, that are triggered um, when something, you know, when a change is, is contemplated. And so, um, you know, we point out a couple of things here for, for those folks, because there's always a lot of discussion happening internally in organizations about, you know, how do we become more competitive or, you know, how do we increase um, margins or, you know, we're going to, um, you know, have some, you know, some type of restructuring activity or merger and acquisition, you know, those are ongoing, um, you know, uh, throughout the year. And so, you know, anyone who's, you know, has a responsibility for maintaining, um, you know, the disclosure statement and, you know, and any associated reporting, you want to be, um, you know, keenly aware of, you know, what that, what that involves. And so, um, you know, here we've got, you know, um, just kind of highlighted, you know, what happens, you know, for processing a change to um, establish um, a cost accounting practice. And so, you know, CFAO, and we'll probably use CFAO, um, you know, um, interchangeably with ACO, because that's frequently, you know, um, who you're working with directly who has responsibility for cost accounting standards administration. Um, but, you know, they, um, you know, that CFAO or ACO needs to uh, receive notification of that prior to implementation of the of the cap change. And so there's certainly we're going to talk about some of the details that you need to provide with that and, um, you know, potential GDM or, or cost impact. Um, but it really is just, you know, kind of a, a highlight, you know, that, you know, you don't want to just do this on the fly. Um, and it's not something that you, um, you know, frequently, you know, would, you know, start to implement mid-year um, in your fiscal year. Um, not that you can't, um, but it certainly, you know, brings a lot of um, complications along with that. And then, you know, as you're having discussions or things are being entertained, um, you know, within the business is really having a clear, um, clear idea of, you know, what does and what does not, um, you know, constitute um, an accounting uh, practice change. And so here we've got just a couple of things, you know, highlighted, you know, that would not, um, you know, would not be a change, you know, if you've got a new, um, a new practice, the first time, you know, a cost is incurred. Um, elimination um, of a cost. Those are some examples of things that, you know, really are more of an administrative change and, and are not necessarily subject to, you know, a full cap change, um, you know, process. And so when you're having, you know, discussions internally, I think one of the, one of the um, instances that we hear about it the most is that if there's a big <clears throat> um, contract opportunity, um, you know, the business um, and technical folks may have strategies for um, becoming a little bit more competitive in rates or something, mm -hmm. you know, setting up a new uh, rate or service center. There's, you know, obviously lots of ways that, you know, you think that the rate optics are going to work better for a particular, um, you know, proposal, which is good to think about, but you definitely want to, you know, be able to insert um, into that discussion that, you know, you you don't just do that if you're a cast covered for a particular um, proposal. Um, and it's something that does, 
you know, have, um, you know, organization wide impact. And, and so that's, you know, really, um, where, you know, becoming familiar with what's involved, um, and being able to, you know, really talk that through what the, you know, what the ripple effect um, of some of those, you know, potential avenues or changes would be is, is really important. Brendan, you know, <clears throat> that's a really good point. I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a lot of conversations with with companies of like, hold on, hit the brakes on that, you know, on whatever cost accounting practice change could be triggered because someone in, in senior leadership is like, hey, we want to set up a new segment because we think it'll be really competitive to go provide this widget to this agency. Yeah. And or they're like, hey, let's just set up this quick little service center because then we can allocate over these costs to the for that widget to this agency. And we always ask as well as that cast covered and you know they, they're like oh yeah we've been cast covered we have a disclosure statement but you know we haven't dusted it off in months or years and well then you kind of ask, keep asking those questions well hold on you know this is that would probably be a cost accounting change and you just kind of see the light bulb go off of <clears throat> oh well you know and you know you have to seek approval for it to, um mm -hmm. you know you have to there's homework attached to this with doing a, um, you know, a, a GDM or potentially a detailed cost impact. And there's a timing with this too. And, um, but that's a, that's a really good point that a lot of people might not even, if you're not finance and accounting and kind of, you know, this, this cost accounting, the standards and federal is your bread and butter. It's really something that's easy to kind of miss. Um, I feel like, you know, we, we sometimes have conversations with companies of, of how to backpedal and how to then notify that this was a change and, you know, what's the impact on the contract. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely items to consider. Yeah, no, good point. And, you know, one of the things, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the timing and, and what, you know, some of the, you know, risks could be, you know, as you go through the process, but, you know, a lot of the way the, you know, the regulation and procedures are prescribed are assuming that, you know, once you submit it, you know, that within certain timelines, you know, as a contractor, you're going mm -hmm. to get, um, you know, whether it be a determination of adequacy and compliance or the fact that the change was immaterial. Um, in many cases, those do hang out there for a long time. Um, so if you, you know, failed to, you know, notify of a change um, and did not really go through the process, that can hang out there for even a number of years and later down the road, you know, audit may pick up on something, you know, that, you know, whether it be in doing your incurred costs audit that, you know, they identify as, you know, does this match up with your, you know, latest uh, disclosure statement. And so then you, you kind of open, um, open up the possibility of having impacts across years that you, you know, hadn't really, <clears throat> um, accounted for. And so it can cause a lot of, um, a lot of work on the back end if, if you don't at least, you know, um, check your boxes in terms of, you know, what the, um, what the requirements are. I think that, you know, we, again, we talk to a lot of companies about if you're considering a change, usually the best time to do that is right before you become cast covered. Um, and because it and kind of using that current state, future state, when we're talking about indirect rates and scenarios and how you price um, and consider the cast coverage piece, because, you know, once you once you foot, once you trigger it and submit the disclosure statement, there's just those hoops that you have to go through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So just a little bit in terms of some of the detail details around, you know, what, you know, what defines, you know, a cost accounting change. And so, um, again, you know, this is what, you know, what both your CFAO or ECO or auditor is going to be um, referencing, um, you know, when you submit it to them. But this is also, you know, what you need to be doing um, in terms of evaluating any adjustments or changes that you might be making. And so, um, you know, you really want to have a clear, clear understanding. So, you know, for a cap change, you know, is there a change in the way um, that costs are measured? Um, assignment of costs, you know, um, in, in cost accounting periods. Um, allocation of costs to cost objectives is there a change in you know allocation base or methodology, and so those are all things. Um, and again, you know the list is not meant to be all inclusive, but you know there's um, certainly um, you know 
I wouldn't say, you know, a fine line between this. It's fairly clear. And that's what the government's, you know, expectation is um, going to be when they're evaluating it. Now, when you're looking at, you know, are there adjustments that need to be made, administrative things that are happening um, that you do want to be current in what you've um, disclosed um, as part of your disclosure statement. But, you know, a couple of things, you know, um, is it the initial adoption of a practice, um, first time costs is incurred, you know, elimination of a cost, um, you know, um, there is a provision around, you know, if it, you know, previously been immaterial, um, you know, that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be a cost accounting practice change. And so, you know, as you're really trying to be thorough about, um, you know, details, things like, you know, obviously account names change and, you know, there's certainly administrative details, um, you know, that you, you know, that happen from year to year that you want to disclose um, and revise so that it's current and accurate, um, you know, but just really understanding, um, you know, some of the, you know, some of the nuances or, or what's really going to trigger this process for you. So I mentioned, you um, just a little bit about, you know, um, kind of a difference between administrative and, you know, practice change. And so just to expand on that, um, you know, a little bit more with, you know, some some kind of basic examples, um, you know, administrative um, change, you know, that could be, um, you know, in this in this instance, you know, actuarial um, assumption, um, increase in the amount of benefits, um, you know, is not a change in the cost accounting practice. Um, if you, you know, elected to um, terminate one of your, you know, retirement or deferred incentive plans, you know, things like that, again, you know, are really just kind of more live examples of, um, you know, instances that, that contractors run into frequently that, you know, again, would need to be disclosed, um, but there's not really the, you know, the full um, notification and, and there wouldn't be any associated, you know, kind of, you um, monetary impact to calculate. Um, in terms of what actual are um, actually our practice changes, you know, before the change, um, you know, um, assignment of depreciation costs, you know, in accounting periods, um, you know, uh, in terms of direct labor cost, um, you know, how that was measured, you know, things um, of that nature, you know, are clearly going to align with what, you know, what the, what the CAS definition of um, cost accounting practice changes are. So again, you can really kind of evaluate that and compare that to what the regulation um, sets um, as you go through in your planning process to know, you know, is this something that for editorial purposes, we need to mark as a revision, or is it something that, you know, does in fact, um, you know, going to require the full um, administration process. You know, to to add to that, I think going back to kind of the definition of administrative pit change versus a practice change, administrative being more updating your information, address, segment names, maybe, uh, you know, eliminating items that might be components of a pool. Um, you know, I, I, I like the you know, if you're increasing the amount of cost that's in um, for the like, for the benefits, for example, here that you just talked about, like that is not a change. Um, hmm. You know, if you have a new GL account, that is not a change, but it might be. So kind of going back to that definition of administrative, the practice change being more of, will it actually affect my underlying cost? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that example of changing depreciation methods is a good example, or, you know, maybe going from, <clears throat> Uh, standard costing to actuals, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned maintaining revisions and having that on record. Um, you know, that having that list of your revisions for your disclosure statement, that can really mm -hmm. help with the back and forth with the government. Um, do you have any other thoughts, Brendan, on just how that can help kind of guide the discussions with the government? Yeah, no, and I know we'll, we'll probably talk about it, um, you know, in further detail as well. But you know, having a, you know, a, a really good matrix or list um, and really at a, at a fine level of detail um, from year to year or revision to revision with with the disclosure statement is is really important. One, you know, it allows you to make sure that, you know, if you've done any name changes or you've updated, you know, a POC um, or an account name, whatever it might be, you know, that you've got, you know, a detailed list you do have to mark those with an R for revised um, in the submission to the government. So one, just for your own, you know, 
purposes of, of tracking it, it's really good to, you know, make sure that you're not missing anything. Also supplying that, you know, that listing, you know, to the government, and you may have additional notes and things that don't go um, in the notification to the government. But by having that, they really facilitate, you know, possibly a, a more efficient review, um, you know, by the ACO or, you know, perhaps audit or, or DCA. Um, the other thing too, is that you, it allows you to indicate, you know, if it's an administrative change or um, cost accounting practice change. And again, that's your assertion as a contractor and your interpretation of it. So by, you know, by, you know, detailing each, each change, you know, um, whether it be editorial or, you know, an actual practice change and asserting, you know, what that is, it helps to give you, you know, to kind of guide, you know, the process hopefully a little bit and take some of the back and forth that might happen while, you know, something you've, um, you change in the disclosure statement without really indicating it in detail, you know, the government might come back and say, well, is this actually an administrative change or does this, you know, um, equate to a practice change? And then you have the, the back and forth of having to work through that. So, yeah, I think that's, um, definitely a best practice, you know, just for internal and uh, government facing purposes. <clears throat> yeah, helping to steer those conversations <clears throat> is, is, is always good to do. Um, yeah. And helps keep people focused too, so you don't go down rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. So if you have a cost accounting change, you know, what are the high levels that are required? So first you need to notify and describe the change, you know, and the adequate level of support needs to be sent to the CFAO or your ACO to evaluate that change. Um, again, this is supposed to be something that's done before the change is effective. Um, but a lot of times this is done after the fact because uh, people don't realize there might've been a change, uh, but it's supposed to be done before. Next companies need to figure out what is the dollar impact to affected contracts. Um, and this is cash cover contracts. And, you know, you need to have the data necessary to demonstrate um, that calculated impact. Now, uh, and then lastly, you need to have the detailed impact to support, you need to might, might, might need to have a detailed cost impact to support the, a desirable change. And that's, more data that's necessary for the CFO to determine if the change is desirable. So when you're notifying the government, uh, if you can demonstrate why the change is beneficial, um, that's even better. So, you know, remember there are, if it's a unilateral um, or voluntary change and it's proved to be material or there's no impact that that's, you want to call that out. Uh, but really the, the, you really want to be able to demonstrate with these different components, with the cost accounting changes, how does this benefit the government long term, and how does that help you uh, help help the contract pricing? Now, one thing that's always sometimes harder is calculating that that cost impact and and having um, being able to reprice those currently priced options for your current cash cover contracts. And having that readily available and being able to do it quickly within the time period that you're supposed to be submitting these different items to the government. Um, and so sometimes, even if you have an approved accounting system, it just takes time on top of the day jobs of the accounting and finance folks to go through adequately, pull that information, put together that cost impact, and then talk with the key parties. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail here in a few minutes about um, a GDM versus a detailed cost impact. Yeah, yeah and just <clears throat> to um, kind of expand, you know, we've got the, you know, kind of high level here, but, um, you know, what, what contractors also need to be, you know, thinking about is that, you know, for accounting practice changes, you know, it may be a unilateral or voluntary change that, you know, contractors um, deciding to make just for, you know, um, you know, to, to keep up with their business or to reflect, um, you know, what practices they want going forward. Um, there could be a required change, you know, which is, you know, um, something required to remain um, compliant with regulation or law. And then, you know, you mentioned, Eric, um, you know, if there's something to support, you know, what would be considered a desirable change. And so, you know, um, in, in cases of, um, you know, voluntary or unilateral changes that a contractor makes, I mean, the government, um, you know, will not pay, you know, increased costs <clears throat> associated with that. Um, yeah. Whereas with a desirable, 
Um, typically, the process is going to be probably a little bit, a um, little bit longer, and certainly we'll have to provide and really prove out the impact. But you know, if it is a desirable change, you know, one which you know the government would benefit from, you know, potentially in years to come. Um, that's something that, you know, um, you know, where, um, you know, where increased costs might be considered by the government. So, you know, it does kind of structure um, your approach and, and how, um, how you start off with, you know, what level of detail you provide and, and what kind of case you're trying to make with it. Um, obviously, with a volunteer, you're um, hoping to demonstrate that it's, you know, immaterial or, um, um, you know, or, or zero impact um, based on the change, but um, that's really a big part of that, that internal planning process. A very good point. Great. So um, a couple of the, you know, the key items that we've been talking about, um, you know, that, that would have to uh, go along with, you know, a submission to, um, you know, kind of help to provide enough information to CFAO or, or ACO, you know, is, you know, is there, you know, is it going to be a detailed cost impact or, um, you know, a GDM? And so, um, you know, obviously the, the GDM is going to be more um, summary level um, of the, you know, CAS, uh, effective CAS contracts. And so typically you want to start, you know, with that, um, because for one, Eric, as you mentioned, there's, you know, significant amount of work trying to look at, um, you know, a detailed cost impact where you're really getting into, you know, each, you know, each contract um, versus a GDM. And that may, you know, a GDM may be sufficient to really show, um, you know, you know, that there is, you know, in, no impact, it's immaterial. Um, in some cases, you know, contractors make changes that actually equate to um, savings um, to mm -hmm. the government. So that's obviously a key point that you want to highlight. Um, you know, in most cases, um, you know, we, you know, we try to help clients put together, you know, what's the best summary um, level that meets the requirement for submission of a GDM and, um, and to start there you know, the CFAO or ACO can always come back and frequently does, you know, ask for greater level of detail or they may um, require uh, a DCI um, to actually help them resolve the, you know, resolve the impact and, and make a determination on the change. So um, there's definitely, um, you know, um, could be a lot more work um, associated with that. Um, I found that in many cases, contractors, you know, are doing a fairly you know, a fairly deep um, level of detail, at least for internal evaluation purposes. Um, you know, the GDM may be sufficient to, um, you know, to help for the uh, government's evaluation of it. Um, but certainly, um, depending on, you know, the volume of, you know, affected uh, CAS contracts, um, you know, it, it can be beneficial to, to really have a, a more granular um, look at it. And one thing, to 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 add on, <clears throat> these numbers should tie uh, between a GDM versus a DCI because a GDM a DCI is a, to, supposed to be a lower level of detail. So even though that should be kind of like a you know duh, Eric, you know of course it does. Sometimes <laughs> as a good check, uh, it should be they should tie, and you know uh, it's some people might be laughing right now, but some, sometimes we see these and they don't, and um, it should be the same source information. So I just wanted to mention that because the GDM really is that summary level by agency um, and then to that fixed price or flexibly price level that we'll get into. Um, you know, one other piece that we, you know, most companies and as a best practice, you can kind of create these as your determining even if you should submit a notification mm -hmm. for change. So this should not be a scramble at the end um, to, to get this in to the government because you might be having discussions with senior leadership and the different stakeholders for, you know, different divisions or different segments. It just figure out who the winners and losers are of this cost accounting change and whose contracts um, as you're making a decision, if you even should be submitting the notification. Yeah, no, you, you bring up a good point there, Eric, in that, you know, um, you know, it can happen where, you know, contractors, you know, identify the change that they want to make. It may be beneficial for, as we talked about, you know, 
um, you know, competitiveness or, or something, you know, that they want to do um, internally with the organization and move forward with, you know, a fairly, um, you know, a fairly general, um, you know, calculated impact for just for their internal purposes and in making that decision. And then later on, when they get into, um, you know, the real detail and looking at it, you know, it could have a different impact than was initially, you know, initially, you know, kind of um, gauged. And so, you know, you certainly don't want to go through the process of, you know, moving towards a change, submitting it, um, you know, and effectively changing your practice, you know, in the eyes of the government, and then determining um, later on that, you know, you actually want to pull that back. And that was, you know, not something that, you know, um, you know, is really going to be beneficial to the organization. So, I mean, it certainly can be done, um, but that's a lot of, a um, lot of administrative effort and, and explaining to do Explain. <laughs> yep. to the government is to, we thought that this was a great idea in our notification and, you know, um, lo and behold, um, after further evaluation, <laughs> Um, likely the costs were, were, were going to be higher and, and the contractor would have to absorb that. So, yep. yeah, um, you know, it's definitely, definitely good to be very certain about, um, you know, which path you're going down with it. Okay, just a little bit more, um, you know, detail in terms of, you know, what does each of those um, entail? So the general dollar magnitude or, or GDM, um, Eric, as you mentioned, you know, allows you to, to really kind of summarize things at um, a little bit um, higher level in terms of, you know, the agency, um, you know, uh, looking at, you know, contracts, um, you know, and it will cover, you know, um, certainly, you know, all the associated costs. And that would be for, you know, fixed price um, as well as flexibly priced. And I know we talk, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, affected CAS contracts. And so, you know, you, you really do want to have a good, um, you know, good handle on, you know, what, what those are, because you don't want to overextend your analysis, be, you know, into contracts that are not, <clears throat> Um, not affected. And, you know, certainly one, that's a lot more work. And two, um, you know, you really want to condense, you know, this population, you know, to be accurate, but to be as, you know, small as possible so that you can, you know, really, um, you know, analyze and understand what the potential, um, you know, whether it's a, a GDM or, you know, detailed cost impact. So um, DCI um, proposal, again, you know, we mentioned that, you know, usually starting off with, um, you know, GDM is um, sufficient level of information for the CFO, CFAO to um, evaluate the, um, CFAO or ACO can always come back and request um, uh, a greater level of detail or a full DCI. Um, and so that will, um, you know, certainly show, you know, estimated, you know, increase um, or, decre or decrease in cost, you know, to each, um, to each contract. And so you're really giving, um, you know, um, a fair level of detail in terms of, you know, who are the, you know, what contracts are the winners or losers or if there are any. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we discuss a fair amount is, um, or we get questions about is, you know, well, if it's, you know, a cost reimbursable contract, you know, um, you know, obviously that's probably the most likely to see these impacts of, you know, year to year rate changes. So why are we talking about fixed price? And so the, you know, the one reason that the government, you know, wants to see that is that so that you're, you know, to determine that there's not like a shift of costs disproportionately to, um, you know, to the cost reimbursable contracts, which would see that, you know, potential rate change um, versus fixed price, which, you know, could lead to, um, you know, increased profit levels for the contractors. So that's really the, you know, part of the big picture that the government is is trying to understand there and at least prove out. So with a little bit of a different lens, some items to consider with the submission process, you know, internally, there needs to be the evaluation on what you know, which contracts will be impacted and also future contract costs and figure out what those administrative burdens to the accounting, finance, and estimating departments are. So do you have to retrain people? 
um, do you need to, especially on the estimating and, and proposal side, do we have to um, update our proposal process and how we do maybe some of our BOEs? From a disclosure statement standpoint, you, need, you would need to go through that disclosure statement and start indicating with ours um, what are the revised practices. So on the side of the disclosure statement, you would write a little, little R where you updated that section. And then as Brendan noted before, keeping a log of all those changes to demonstrate um, one compliance and also to help guide that conversation. Um, and if it's really an administrative change or if it's a cap. And a lot of times that's outlined in the notification letter too to the government too when you submit that disclosure statement or the disclosure statement in. And then from a cost impact standpoint, start with the lowest level or start with the lowest level of dollar impact to demonstrate the change. And then always remember that the government can request more detailed information, but it's not necessary to make that initial determination. Now they might, they probably will come back and ask for more, but start with that summary level or the lowest level um, to to uh, to start that submission to show what that change would be. Yeah, yeah and, and one thing um, around that too is, I mean, there had there have been some decisions around that that you know really um, again you know are not necessarily instructing the ACO or CFAO that they can only request um, certain amount of information, but that they should um, be trying to accomplish uh, making a determination on the change with you know, I'll say the, the least, uh, the least amount of data, but um, effectively, that's what it is, is that, you know, the, the starting point for the government evaluating this shouldn't always be, well, we need a DCI on everything. Um, you know, they should, um, they should adhere to, you know, kind of those, um, you know, that guidance that, you know, if, if they can um, adequately evaluate it with, you know, a GDM or, or something, less detailed that they should um, pursue it that way. So again, you, you can't, can't always prescribe what they're going to do, but you know you can lean on that a little bit to, to try and hope that they will. All right. I think it's a perfect segue to our next series or next topic about timeline and yeah. you know how to manage kind of that submission process. Yeah. So um definitely, you know, you know, the preferred or or prescribed uh, timeline for, you know, submitting a, a cost accounting practice change. So again, as we said before, you know, the notification to your CFAO or ACO, um, you know, should have enough detail so that they can understand, you know, what was the practice, um, what precisely is the change and, and what's the outcome. And so whether that's establishing a new um, rate pool, um, you know, kind of redistributing or, you know, uh, coming up with a new allocation method. Um, you really do want to kind of lay out, um, you know, lay out exactly um, what's happening um, so that they can hopefully within the context of your um, submission to them, understand it. I mean, there certainly can be uh, back and forth and, and further uh, questions. You would also need to submit the, you know, revised disclosure statement um, reflecting um, what those changes were. Certainly from the government standpoint, you know, they're going to do a comparison, you know, between your most recent and make sure that it's accurately, um, you know, depicted and described. And, you know, the key thing here is, you know, that should be done 60 days in advance of the effective date. So, for many, you know, many companies that are on, um, you know, calendar year, fiscal year, you know, that November 1st um, date is, you know, is a key one to actually um, demonstrate that you're submitting it in a timely manner. Um, and the, you know, the, the rationale for that is so that, you know, the ACO reviewing has time to, you know, look for adequacy and compliance of the practice and the disclosure statement. Um, hopefully make it, you know, a determination, you know, that it's, um, you know, that it is in fact a, you know, perhaps a voluntary change, but there's no impact or it's immaterial so that you can move into um, utilizing the practice with some assurance that, um, you know, that, you know, you're not going to have any, you know, recourse from it or, um, you know, future non-compliance. Um, and so, you know, obviously just the, you know, the process, you'll have the ACR review, um, you know, the determination, um, you know, perhaps if it's immaterial, um, or they may, you know, kind of extend the process and act, ask for that DCI or, or some additional description. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind that I think happens quite a bit is that, 
you know, a contractor may <coughs> get, um, you know, a notice of um, adequacy of that revised uh, disclosure statement, um, but they may not get um, resolution of or determination on the actual um, cost accounting practice change prior to implementing it. And so, you know, that really can lag. And so, you know, you're you're kind of going into a new practice and a new fiscal year potentially um, that you don't have, you know, the determination or opinion from the government. So, you know, there is risk, you know, that they could come back and determine it non-compliant or that, you know, their view of the impact, um, you know, is otherwise. So, um, again, that's not uncommon. Um, so many contractors, you know, kind of go into the um, utilizing their new change. Um, however, if you've at least given the proper notification and timeline, um, you know, you can really check your boxes that you've done your part and that it's really in the government's court to um, to handle. Yeah, I think that constant communication and follow-up is, is, is key there. Um, and if you uh, hit that timeline and, and can document that, you might open up other avenues to explore if they come back and state that, you know, they don't agree, so. Yeah. So from a timeline standpoint, um, you know, this, you do want to be, the first thing you want to do is define if the change is really a cost accounting change. Again, is it is an administrative or is it a practice change or is it just an elimination of a GL account or an increase in a cost? Is it really a change? Because then that would impact the rest of this. Next would be in that 60, day, prior, 60 days prior, notifying the government. During that time, you are revising your disclosure statement, you're calculating the cost impact. Um, you are figuring this out prior to, and really actually probably prior to notifying the government and if you wanna do this or not. <clears throat> um, before you submit, you wanna review internally, make sure everything is, uh, all, the, all the ducks in a row. Um, and then you would be submitting your GDM and starting to update or any other information they might be asking for. GDM would be prior to and that original notify, originally notifying the government. Um, the submission to the government would be a detailed cost impact, just to clarify. Uh, and then if once you hear back from the government, you'd be updating your policies and procedures, maybe estimating manuals, maybe other checklists or items that might impact this. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, and that last point is a good one, too, that, you know, sometimes, you know, may get overlooked in, you know, the actual kind of providing what you have to submit to the government. But, you know, making sure that, you know, internal um, procedures, policy, um, you know, are reflective of it is really, you know, is critical because, you know, one, you want to be consistent with what you're, you've disclosed, but two, um, you can't, contractors can lean back on, you know, is it, you know, here's our defined, you know, procedure, here's, um, you know, what we've been, um, you know, working to. And so not that that could, you know, override, um, you know, casts, um, you know, by way of, of a consistent procedure, but it really does help to kind of support that case if you ever have to defend, you know, a practice or, um, you know, something you put in place. Very true. You know, and, and to close out, um, we wanted to cover some pitfalls and then some, you know, larger considerations with a cost accounting change. Uh, you know, and from a, from a pitfall standpoint, what we typically um, are helping companies with or advising on how to navigate is um, a lot of the items that you see here, you know, probably the biggest one is late notification um, of something uh, of a cap. Um, and that is considered right off the bat to be in noncompliance with that, you know, uh, that outlined 60 days um, that you're supposed to notify to. Um, not describing the change, uh, you know, to the level of detail required. Uh, not providing a GDM with that notification. Uh, again, it's something that can be easily overlooked. It's it is in it is outlined in the FAR. However, sometimes it's it's just something that like oh we just need to notify the government. Um, especially companies that think it might be an administrative change, but it might actually be a, a practice change. That's an area where that can pop up. Um, not assessing all costs uh, cost impacts across all contracts. So you know forgetting about a cool uh, you know. Brendan, your point earlier, um, thinking that, hey, fixed price, I don't need to include this, or subcontracts, I don't need to include this yeah. because it's not a cost plus. You know, it, everything when it comes to an accounting system, you know, approved accounting system is always cost plus, flexibly priced, you know, that world. 
well, this impacts fixed price as well. So considering everything, um, you know, identifying uh, an administrative change as a cap, you know, you, some, some of those items are uh, cost accounting practice changes, but it's an administrative. So updating that, updating that on your disclosure statement. Um, a lot of times we're co helping companies state that, hey, you, you just need to put the little R next to the disclosure statement and resubmit it in because during an audit, the government might've noted that addresses changed, the names of segments changed, um, the items and descriptions, even though it's not a cost accounting change, isn't accurate. So, you know, there might be some kind of administrative items there. And then um, lastly, untimely response to the government um, for these requests. You know, I kind of think here as the contractor, you're the one submitting this request. So you're the one that started this uh, typically. Um, so when the government comes back and asks for certain items, having just that timely response and helping to define what those, what that timeline is, you know, sometimes this is um, a, a change that starts with the government. However, a lot of times it's also a, the contractor doing this. So having open communication, talking and establishing um, parameters to make sure everyone's on the same page when it comes to timeline. Great. And, and just, I think we've touched on, on each of these, you know, points as we've gone through Eric, but, you know, just, um, you know, I think that this is a really good, um, you know, kind of summary uh, graphic, <clears throat> you know, to folks to, um, to uh, kind of put up on their, on their board if they're, if they're trying to keep it in mind. But, you know, again, you know, it's, um, you know, what are all the, um, you know, pieces to the puzzle of doing this? And, you know, um, obviously there's, you know, we've talked through um, pretty significant process involved. And so there's certainly, um, you know, resources and, you know, um, enough time um, in terms of planning and, and truly assessing that, um, you know, there can be winners and losers depending on your, on your contract mix. And so really um, understanding that and what the, you know, what the kind of overall um, impact is to the government and being able to kind of explain that, um, you know, not only just showing the dollars, but there may be a bigger point that you need to make. Um, certainly, you know, any changes to your, to your cost accounting practice changes, you really do need to assess, you know, what does that do to some of your other business systems and, and what other things might need to be updated um, in terms of estimating practices um, and so forth that, you know, certainly need to be consistent with that. Um, and that's probably probably one of the biggest um, trouble areas if, you know, if someone's got a disclosed practice, um, you know, and that they're going to estimate a certain way, but are, um, you know, are actually accumulating it differently. So um, you need to think about it across the organization as much as possible. Um, yeah. And then the, you know, end goal really, um, you know, is really looking at the the big picture and, and in many cases, long term, um, you know, perhaps you've got um, you know, different opportunities or, um, you know, contract types, um, you know, are changing um, in coming years. Um, you may have a big program that's looking to go, um, you know, a certain route. And so really understanding, you know, is this something that's going to be impactful for only a year or two, or is this really where you want to be further down the road as well? And, and with that, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes simpler is better when it comes to a lot of this and uh, showing how this change again will benefit the government. It will be simpler. It will make lives easier. Is always you know, kind of to that ending goal um, and thinking holistically. You know, going back to the other systems. Uh, sometimes again, senior uh, talking with, keeping in mind everyone and all the different parties and functions of the organization that's going after new work. You know, sometimes you might get a. Um, a, the, during a proposal effort, someone come up and say, hey, we need this new rate because this will make us so competitive. And uh, again, and we, we want to create a PMO rate, for example, I feel like it's a topic that keeps coming up right now. And you have a disclosed, uh, a submitted disclosure statement, you have set, set amount of rates, um, there should be road or controls in place and policies that 
during the estimating process, all rates need to come from accounting and finance um, in a, 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 as part of the checklist item. So keep making sure that it doesn't impact those other systems because then it could, you know, if there's a CAS issue, then it could turn into an accounting system issue or, it, you know, could, again, kind of snowball, you know, once it become an estimating system issue to your point. So all of these together kind of thinking holistically um, and how does it impact the other systems? How does it impact the underlying costs on those contracts? And understanding the time that it just takes to do this. It's, you know, it's not a uh, two week process because there's just so much, so much, so many stakeholders to talk to and, and discussions to be had. Yeah. <clears throat> so with that, um, that is the end of our uh, part two of our CAS webinar series. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Brendan or myself, um, and we would be happy to be a sounding board and talk through the situation. We know that, again, we could dive deep into many of these topics for their own webinars. Um, however, we wanted to keep it high level of part one, uh, going through the cost accounting standards, what it means, and what are those standards. So if you missed that, please visit our website to, to pull that presentation down. And you know, this one outlining, if you have, if you are cast covered and you have a change, what are the steps that you need to consider? And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about that process. Appreciate your time and thank you for joining.